thank you all for coming. My name is Sue. Um, we've got Julie Corcoran here as well from Kingston Libraries. And of course, we have our wonderful guest author, Kyle. Uh, before we go any further, um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we in Victoria virtually gather on today, the people of the Eastern Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging, for they hold the memories, the traditions, stories and culture of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples across the nation. And uh, on behalf of Kingston Libraries, here we go. Um, I'm just going to do a little introduction about Kyle. He'll probably blush now. Um, Kyle Perry is a drug and alcohol counsellor based in Hobart in Tasmania. He has um, grown up around the Tasmanian bush and the oceans with the landscape as a key feature of his writing and his spare time. He loves the sea and his entire leg is covered in ocean tattoos which is a really nice piece of trivia I didn't know about. Um, he loves the sea. Um, and uh, The Bluffs has been translated into five languages. That was Kyle's debut novel. And it was shortlisted for the Dimmick's Book of the Year and the Indies debut fiction book of the year. It was also long listed for the Australian Book Industry Awards General Fiction Book of the Year. So some amazing accomplishments. And I believe very recently it also won an award for the editing, um, which was lovely to see. Um, a nice nod to the people behind the scenes. So that's great. Um, Kyle's latest novel, The Deep, uh, is set in and around the Tasman Peninsula and was published on the 20th of July. Set around the powerful drug ring family, the Dempseys, this new novel features a ruthless matriarch, a black sheep, a long lost child and a fiercely protective mother. A twisting and engrossing tale, The Deep has a lot to say about family, peer pressure and the spectre of toxic masculinity. Deception, cowardice and courage all have equal roles to play as the action unfolds and the story asks us to ponder the question, how far will you go for family? When are the sacrifices asked of you too much? So that gives you a bit of a feel for what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, Kyle, I was wondering if you could perhaps begin by telling us a bit about writing and the road that led you to writing The Bluffs, the novel that really sort of broke you here in Australia. Um, you've been writing for quite a long time, haven't you? Yes. Yes, I have. Um, I mean, first of all, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, it's good to see you all. I'm sorry, I'm on my phone at the moment, so I have to actually open up the participants and scroll through to see you but i'll be doing that as we go um also want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which i am right now the Muwi Nina people um and pay my respects to their elders past and present in terms of writing i always wanted to be a writer um and i, I remember it coalescing into a tangible idea i guess in grade six and that was when um Sorry, my cat is now drinking my <laughs> cup of tea. <laughs> um, I coalesced in grade six because I sent an email off to Tamara Pierce. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Tamara Pierce. She's a um, uh, fantasy writer, mainly, I mean, it's young adult genre, but anyone can read it. I read them as adults and I still love them. Um, and I sent her an email and I basically said, look, I just found your books. Uh, I really love them. I want to be a writer like you one day. And she replied and she said something like, I get so many e emails every day and every, I don't always reply to them, but I'm going to reply to you because I'm quite charmed by your email and I think you've got what it takes. And I remember that being like, uh, I don't know. I was like, yeah. I was like, yeah, I know. That's why I emailed you. Like, I know this is coming for your job. But it definitely kind of validated it for me. Um, and so... From that moment on, that was my goal I was setting towards. And it was it was kind of really inside of me. It really lit me up. I love the idea of being a writer. I love storytelling. Had all these ideas. We daydream all the time. And when I, uh, so that was grade six. So then the next four years of high school, I kind of kept that pretty secret. Um, down here in Tasmania, sorry, we've got grade seven to 10 is called high school. And then 11 and 12 is called college. So for me, high school was just grade seven to 10. And during that time, I was like, yeah, I want to be a writer. That's what I want to do. I'll work towards that, but I won't tell anyone. And I'll keep all my other options open just in case. 
But when I was in grade 10, um, I finally put my, turned my hand towards writing and I wrote my first full length novel, age 16. And uh, that was kind of where I first got a taste for it. Um, the process of then to where I am today was a very long process because for the next 10 years, I was writing um, a book a year. I averaged a manuscript a year for 10 years. Um, and they were all in the young adult genre. They're all in the, the young adult fantasy genre, just like Tamara Pierce. Um, that was what I wanted to write. That's what I thought, I, I, only thing I thought I could write. Um, and then at the final, the final book in that kind of season, book 10, got really, really close with this New York City agent. Uh, really close. It was a revise and resubmit. And any of you guys here now who want to be writers or have been submitting to agents, you might be familiar with that word or that term, but revise and resubmit is essentially when an agent says, look, I like your book kind of enough to want to represent you, but there's a few things I want you to change. Change them and send them back and then we'll continue the conversation. So he'd, he'd asked me for a re revise and resubmit I revised and resubmitted. I sent it back. Um, and then he was like, ah, it's good, but not quite what I think I can represent. What else have you got? And so at that stage, I'd finished my degree in counselling. I was working as a, as a high school youth worker. So I had a bit of money for the first time in a long time. And so I thought what I'm going to do is, is pay some editor to read this book and fix it. Just tell me what I'm doing wrong because I'm going crazy here. I'm, I've been doing this for a decade. This is the closest I've ever got. I'm still not anywhere. I've got nothing to show for it. So I reached out um, to the lady who would become my agent, Haley Nash. And I said, hey, can I hire you to edit my book? And I explained a bit of my story. And her reply was literally, before I help you spend your money, let's talk about the fact that you've been writing this for 10 years. Um, maybe like, maybe you should try something, writing something else. Maybe you should, you know, flex your creativity in a different genre. And initially I was like, no way. Like I can't, this is all I can write. This is all I've been writing. And I really like this genre. I'm not going to write in anything else, but I slept on it. And then the next, uh, the next day I called her and I said, all right, um, can I hire you for, for like a consultancy phone call? Uh, just for an hour and then we'll brainstorm where I'm at, what my passions are, what my interests are. And let's come up with a, a different kind of book direction to go. Cause part of my degree was, was coaching. So I knew a lot about how consultancy worked and I knew, knew the value of it. And so I, I hired her for a phone call and basically she said, look, what, are, what else have you read that you've enjoyed? And straight away I said, well, I just finished reading the drive by Jane Harper. And um, she said, look, that's great. Um, you know, what, do you like crime? I said, yeah, no, I love crime. Um, mainly just kind of read young adult detective series, but, um, you know, I love crime shows. And at the time I was working in a school for disengaged youth and there was a big criminal element to that. There were, we were dealing with, like I was meeting police officers for like the first time in my life. So there was part of me that was working with little criminals and she said, do you, do you think you could write like a crime novel? And I said, no way. I can't write for adults. I can't write general fiction. All I can do is young adult. But anyway, I thought about that and I thought, I enjoy this topic. I've got a lot to say. I know a lot about drug and alcohol as well from my placement. So I sat down and I wrote the first draft of The Bluffs, my debut in, in three months. So that that's kind of... A very long answer to your question, Sue, but but that's how I went from loving writing to actually where I am today was was quite a big. If we if we're looking at a book, there was a big character arc before I could get from six, six grade six Kyle emailing Tamara Pierce to now best selling nationally acclaimed shortlisted book of the year author. Wow, that's some um, that's that's quite a journey. Quite a journey and um, really interesting about um, paying for the phone call. I think that's um, what a fantastic offer that was, you know? Yeah. And I don't think, I think a lot of writers um, are quite 
hesitant for external feedback um, and also just know what they want to do and they're going to do it till the day they die, which was me for 10 years, <laughs> for 10 years. But I was just so devastated by this really close and then near miss. And then I also, again, because my, my degree was jointly in coaching and I know how life coaching works and I know the benefits. So I was able to do it, but I know how hard it was and I know how hard it would be for other writers to kind of make that call as well. Right. Well, yeah. um, that, that, that actually brings me um, a little bit to the, the next question I was going to ask you about how um, the ways that your profession in counselling um, has informed your storytelling and the way you tell your stories um, and particularly the voices in your book um, of the young people. Um, yeah. You know, in, in the bluffs in particular, obviously, you know, you've got a group of young girls, um, you know, and I think uh, I, I thought I felt you captured that pretty well, having been a young girl myself <laughs> <laughs> many, many years ago. Um, and I, you know, I can remember um, feeling there, like I was invincible at, at mm. you know, at, at a certain age. And um, I got, I really got that feeling about those girls involved in the bluffs. Um, for those of you who may not have read the bluffs, it centers around a, a group of girls that go missing on a school camp and the ensuing fallout um, from that. But I'm wondering, you know, is that something, was, does that sort of hark back to that sort of YA connection where you sort of felt like you wanted to write for that audience? Was that sort of a way of keeping that connection, do you think, in that, in that first book? No, it wasn't, well, not really, because there's not, aside from the first chapter, there's not a um, young adult perspective. It's, it was definitely dealing with adult issues, but what I wanted to do was, I guess, um, flip that on its head a bit. So those who've read The Bluffs know that, I mean, it's, you find it about halfway through anyway, that the girls are a lot more in control of things than first suspected. And then, of course, you know, it all goes out of control again. But what the part of the reason I wanted to explore that was because I was working with teenage girls. And I was working especially exploring the current, at that time, current um, social media landscape. But what really, and I'll tell you this, I'll tell you this story um, because it's, it's important and it definitely answers your question. One of the schools I was working at, we had an instance with a group of teenage girls who had a Facebook message group. I think it was a Facebook message group or some other kind of uh, online group where they were sending each other photos of their, their self-harm scars or their self-harm self wounds. And it was like the group was glorifying it in a way. There was, a, there was this sense of one-upmanship. And hearing that as, as a youth worker in that school, it, it, it made me feel sick. And it takes a lot to, to have that effect on me uh, because I deal with all this stuff. It takes quite a lot to rattle me, but that rattled me. And that's, as those who read the bluffs know, that, that that comes up a little bit in the book. And that was the thing that, I wanted to pivot the story around was that one moment that happened that in the way it made me feel in the way I knew it would make my readers feel, I knew that was an experience that was scary. You know, it was an experience that cast such a great lens on society. And also I just felt I had some authority as a youth worker to speak to that. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's fair enough. I, I do have a question here from um, from Linda in the audience. She wanted to just go back to what you were talking about before, and how did you find um, working with an editor? Yeah, look, I I loved it. I loved it, and I have to say, probably because I'd spent ten years trying to do it alone, and I was just hungry to know what to do to fix it. Um, also, there was definitely the fact that originally working with my agent um i was she wasn't going to represent me she wasn't going to sign me up until i had made revisions that she had asked for so it was definitely a matter of okay i'm really close 
for me to get for me to get across the line, I'm going to do what she says. I'm going to need to play the game. And so I set out with that mentality. I'm ashamed to say it wasn't a like, oh, this will make the book better. It was I just want to get an agent and I'll sell myself to do it. But the thing is, when you actually <laughs> when you actually take on the advice, somehow it makes the book better. Who would have thought that editors know what they're doing? But I found that with with the um, the bluffs originally. There was like six point of view characters in the bluffs and it was um, suggested that I bring it down to three. And at the start, I'm like, how am I going to do that? Like there's scenes that happen that these characters are not involved in because I had about four detectives. I had this massive investigation um, team, which makes sense. Like realistically, there would have been a massive investigation team. Um, And so I, I paired that back to the three point of view characters in the bluffs and it made it so much stronger. It made it so much better. And so when I stepped into the editing process with Penguin, my publisher, I was open to everything. I was like, yep, absolutely. You know, and the thing to remember though, too, about editing is editing is usually you've got the text, um, which is option A. um, And then you've got the editor's comments, which is option B. My job as a writer is to find option C, which is in the middle. So they're telling me that option A isn't working. There's something wrong with the text. Their suggestion is option C. If I take that suggestion, it's probably not going to work because they're not the writer, but it, 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 it feeds, it kind of inspires me to find that middle ground, which is going to be the right outcome for the text. There we go. That's better. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, I do. Uh, I did read a little bit about um, the research that you did for the deep, and I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Um, it, it some of the notes I got from um, from your publisher um, when we um, were talking about doing this session. Um, in terms of the deep dive research, it says uh, it, it tells me that not only did you learn to scuba dive which we would I'd like to talk about that in a minute. Um, but you also you also visited drug dens and, and, and spoke to people close to the drug scene. I, I would imagine that would be pretty darn confronting as well. How did you find that? Yeah, it was. So the whole time I wrote The Deep, I was working as a case manager and counsellor in a, in a men's rehab. So I was exposed to that side of the world uh, in my day job. But part of the, like my colleagues had lived experience. So they had a lot of insights for me. Um, They introduced me to other people. I made other friends kind of from that scene. And so there was a few instances where I was with a mate and he wanted to go drop by his dealer and, and get, some, get some of his product. And I just happened to be there. I'm like, he's like, are you coming? I said, heck yeah, I'm coming. Like, and we, 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 we pulled up in the taxi. Um, and then we kind of went up the door because I found out that this wasn't his, wasn't his dealer. He didn't know this guy. He'd never been there before. And so he goes up to the door and he knocks on the door. And the, the guy comes out with like, bow and arrow pointing straight at, <laughs> straight at us and he's like you're shouting he's like what are you what are you doing here because in 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 that world you don't show up unannounced you text ahead you say if you're coming you say and you've got to be vouched for so you can't just cold call you can't just rock up on a on a dealer's front front step and say hey look i'm here for here for this i can imagine sure <laughs> and so so he's there anyway we're going there my mate's really good at like calming him down I'm good at calming people down too. It's part of my job. He realized that we were harmless. And then he's, he just flipped. He's like talking to us, real happy, he sits us down, gives my mate what he's looking for, um, brings out some throwing knives, lets us have a go at throwing them at his couch. At the end, he gives us this massive tray of like native honey. Like, I mean, he, he was off his head. I, you know, I mean, well, he might not have been actually. He might have just been really, really friendly and wanted to stab his honey. I got the sense he was lonely, like most of them are. So anyway, so it was like scary, but I don't know. I kind of been through it worse, to be honest. And then another time, I went to um, 
one of my other friends, a different friend, uh, he, he was going through a bit. He wanted me to go kind of pick him up. Um, but where he was staying was at like a, a house that had very strong affiliations with certain criminal outlaw organizations. So, he, he, and I, cause he said, I, he said, oh, I needed some help. I said, do you want me to come pick you up? And he said, nah, you better not come here. And then he flipped. He said, actually, nah, come here. I want to introduce you to my friends and I want to introduce them to you. So anyway, I drove down there and I texted him and he came out and got me and like took me through the, I think the, th- like the three levels of defense. And then I was in the house and meeting all these really interesting guys and then I sat down and then we're like um, on the couch. I was with my mate. He was in a bit of a rough way. And there's this other guy there. And then we're having a good chat. And then the uh, the smart TV was there and someone had the remote. So we started like sharing music and then funny YouTube videos. And then I found out he was the president of the, of the organization. So anyway, I had, a, I had a good time. I was having fun. Um, we, were, we were nearly just going to sleep there. But at the last minute, we changed our mind. And I thought, actually, no, we should probably... Let's go. <laughs> so, so we left. But what all that does, I guess, what 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 I'm passionate about, obviously, is people in this in this world. I'm especially passionate about helping people break out of cycles. But I'm also really interested and really passionate about changing the narrative about how people who use drugs are seen. Because you know, I say I can say I sit down and and shed funny YouTube videos with a very influential criminal and people are very surprised, but I mean, in reality, they watch funny YouTube videos too. Like they're looking for connection. The politics of, of the underworld are beyond us, but the the rest of the time, they're just normal people trying to have their needs met. They're trying to, to find a, find a place. And I try to get that across a bit in the bluffs with Murphy, who's a cannabis dealer. Um, I was really, I really wanted him to be a cannabis dealer and to be a good guy. That was something I was quite really, I don't know, at the start. And then with the deep, I wanted to again explore how difficult redemption can be or how difficult rehabilitation can be for someone. And the main analog for that was my character, Mac. The main, I guess he's the main character, really. The story centers on him. And he was, Mac, the character of Mac was inspired by so many of the clients I've worked with who all have such similar stories, unique in some ways, but at, at its core, sense of um, displacement, lack of belonging, childhood trauma, um, this sense that you've got to be something else to, to fit in or to succeed or to be safe. And then just once you've, you've been through any form of substance dependence, any form of you know, addiction, dependence, how hard it is to come back to society. Um, anyway, no, that's 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 really interesting. It, it's in, I find it fascinating too that um, Mac, in particular, and and Murphy, in a way too, um, in the Bluffs, are both sort of victims of that um, that to- toxic masculinity that I was talking about before. Um, you know, Murphy's sort of got his brother there, and and you know they're they're drug dealers, or well, they're growing marijuana in the forest, and um, he's he's trying to live in two worlds almost, be a dad um, and and then you know run his business. Um, and 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 Mac, I felt was kind of almost like the extrapolation of that. So he's he's been really really down in the dregs and in the gutter and has pulled himself back out and then he finds himself getting pulled back in. Um, and uh, I I also find it really interesting that. You made the the head of the family in in the deep, um, that the head of that 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 business, um, the matriarch of that, that of that criminal family was was so controlling, and I, I just wonder, you know, you, you're talking you talked about um, encountering lots of men in in the, the environments you went into. Um, did you did you see any women in those environments in in those sort of situations, or was it really just mainly mainly blokes? I'm just curious as to how that happened in in the book. Yeah, so my my caseload was only males, but I'll say this: two thirds 
of the clients I worked with were facing extraordinary complications in their life because of females in their life. And generally it was around custody of children. I'm not going to go too deeply into how domestic violence laws work in, in our country um, and the way they've been set up, but there's a lots, lots of situations where it becomes extremely difficult for the father to um, get custody or even contact with the children once certain allegations are made. And those allegations don't even need to be founded on truth. They just need to be made sometimes. And so I was encountering a lot of men who, some of them for sure, you know, dangerous people and there needs to be something in place to protect the mother of the kids and the kids. But there were others where you can look at the reports and you could tell that the system had, people in their lives had used the system against them. And it, it opened up a really fascinating conversation and it comes in, I guess, to you know, what, we, what we refer to as toxic uh, masculinity is that it's great, it's great to have these conversations about toxic masculinity um, and about toxic femininity. But all these conversations happen around the middle class. We talk about how it relates to middle class people. We talk, we talk about how it relates to generally pretty functioning people of society. Whereas what we don't talk about is the, the other layer where we go down into people struggling with homelessness, with drug dependence, with, with poverty, with trauma. When it comes down to that level, it's almost like the law of the jungle. And so a lot of these issues down there, men rely on their fists and women in lieu of having fists, they'll rely on the courts, lies of manipulation and whatever other, you know, tactics they can use in their defense. And so it's extremely fascinating. And sometimes it can be fr quite frustrating because I can get on Instagram and I've got someone up there, you know, having a rant about um, toxic masculinity, which is great, but it's not going to filter down to the people who are, who are experiencing it at its worst. You're not, yeah. not going to see someone up there who's, you know, homeless at the moment, trying to look after her kids dealing with an abusive ex you're not going to see them what you these instagram rants aren't helpful for those people because down at the base level in the underworld it's the law of the jungle so in ivy i was i wanted to explore i guess the the natural to succeed in that world as a woman that's what you become in a way you become that kind of figure and she achieved it in a very real way used her smarts, used her, her talking, used her manipulation, used her money to get everything she needed, um, that as a man um, would be a whole different trajectory. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, she, she reminded me a lot. I don't know if anyone here has seen the series Justified, but um, she reminded me a lot. There's a matriarch in that who, um, among other things, brews moonshine. And um, she's she's as ruthless as Ivy. Absolutely, I would I would commend that series to you. I reckon you'd actually probably really enjoy that series, Kyle. Justified, yeah. Okay. Justified, um, yeah. It's set in the south, um, around drugs, and uh, it's it, it, about a crime family. And and the the matriarch is um, <laughs> she's 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 uh, she's hard work. That's for sure. Um, let's touch on something a little lighter. Okay, um, yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, the scuba diving, I'm, I'm assuming, obviously, there's, there's some scuba diving and um, abalone diving um, in the deep. Mm. Um, and so you, you deliberately went in and, and learned to scuba dive or were you already a scuba diver? So I had scuba dived before, but I didn't have my ticket. So to scuba dive in Australia, or, um, you need to have a ticket in order to hire gear. Um, I didn't have it, but I had been scuba diving with friends who were instructors. So they had a license to take me along. But when I um, set out to write this book, I knew I wanted to have scuba diving scenes. I knew I wanted to explore underwater caves. I knew I had all these great ideas from my experience scuba diving in northern Tasmania, but I needed to do it down here. So I booked in to do my scuba diving ticket and then COVID came along and the um, 
it got cancelled. Um, so I wrote all those scenes in based on what I remembered, based on what I researched, based on what I'd kind of um, watched on YouTube. And then when restrictions lifted, I was able to go and do my ticket again. And so it, I don't know if you've ever been scuba diving, but <laughs> it is, it's terrifying. It I've, is, been, I've been snorkeling, not the same thing, I know, but that's as far as I've gotten. Yeah, look, look I, you, you got to go down pretty deep to get your ticket. You got to demonstrate, you can go, I think it's 18 meters or it might be 13, I can't remember, I'm bad with numbers. So when I'd been scuba diving before, I hadn't gone that deep, not even nearly that deep. I was basically near the surface. And so we went down deep and deep. And I mean, I'd already done the, the two pool sessions um, and, and I'd done it before. I felt pretty confident, but no, it was, it was terrifying. And there was like, the, what was terrifying is there was a few, the first thing that went wrong was my weight belt. The One of the weights fell out of my weight belt because it was just hired gear. And so when that happened, I started rocketing to the surface. And, and when I'm going through all these things in my head thinking, oh man, what have I got to do? I've got to breathe out. Otherwise my lungs are going to explode. Like, I was like panicking, Bob to the surface, they come up, they put the weight belt in. Like he, the instructor, he was pretty, you know, he'd seen it all before, but I was like panicking hard. I'm like, I don't think I want to do this again. And I'm pretty good. Like I don't, I don't really like deep water that much, but I thought I was more in control of myself. I'm actually kind of scared of the ocean. But I figured if I had this on my mouth, I'd be okay. <laughs> you know, I think as long as I can breathe, I'm okay. I didn't expect to like lose my buoyancy. I mean, to yeah. Anyway, and then the next thing that went wrong is that I was down there. Dive, we got buddies real close to us. We're to dive with, and I'm like, you know, doing this with my hands. And then this big current comes along, and down here at the bottom of the world, um, water is quite heavy. So the, the temperature of, of it and something about maybe the, the mineral composition, I don't know, but this close to Antarctica, the water is very different um, than elsewhere. And so water is quite dense. And so these currents come along and I'm not used to swimming in this kind of water. I I've, I've, don't really swim down here in Hobart. I swam heaps up the Northwest coast where I'm from, grew up in the ocean, but down here, the weather's, the, the ocean scares me. It's quite heavy. I've nearly drowned a couple of times down here. I don't do it anymore. So I'm under the water, this current comes along, it's like a freight truck, hits us. I'm waving my arms like this and I rip his regular, his breather out of his mouth. My buddy's breather out of his mouth. And then he's, he's freaking out quite rightly. He grabs my spare breather. I'm freaking out because I nearly just killed this dude. I'm not having fun anymore. I don't want to be here, but I'm like, I've got to stay now to the end. Like, oh, anyway. So after that little experience um i was pretty shaken up and i thought you know what i've got my ticket now i'm just gonna maybe not do this for a little while longer or at least definitely not in these waters so you haven't been back since that no not. i don't think i've even been in the ocean to be honest so not down here it's um yeah it yeah <laughs> i love the ocean i'll look at it all day if i'm elsewhere i'll swim in it I love, you know, I love surfing. I love snorkeling. I did, I did love diving, but I'm, but down here, the weather, the, the water's different. The water just does different things. And that's something I wanted to get across in the deep too, to say that yeah. water is quite treacherous down here at the bottom of the world. Actually, that was actually what I was about to move to. Good segue. Thanks, Kyle. Um, <laughs> I was, I was going to talk about um, the landscape in both of your books, um, in the bluffs, the landscape at the, you know, the limestone cliffs and everything is just so evocative and the, the forest and the mist and the rain and everything. It just, you really feel like you're there in the middle of it. It was one of the most powerful things I found about your writing. And I'm, I'm sure those who have read your books already have, would, would agree. Um, and, and yes, obviously that experience you had <laughs> scuba diving, um, definitely I can see how that informed um, the black water, you know, the descriptions of the black water and, and um, the black wind and everything um, in the deep. Um, is, is it, it, I feel like the landscape um, where you live in, in Tassie is really important to you and, and the land and the, and the wilderness and the natural world. Um, you, I feel like you have a real affinity to that. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, um, and it's been interesting. So I wasn't aware of this fact until 
probably once the date was released and because um, people had read both books and they were asking this exact same question, you know, tell us about your connection to, to the island. Um, and I had, I was just answering the question, you know, like, yeah, yeah, I'm really, I grew up in the country. Tassie's in my blood. I love the wilderness. I love the bush. You know, it's part of my heartbeat. But it wasn't until, again, about a month or two ago where I realized, wow, this is actually must be quite, it's a big energy in my books. And I wasn't really aware of it, I guess. I wasn't fully cognizant of the fact that the energy of Tasmania and the wilderness and the landscape hums through the book so much. I guess I just kind of saw it as normal, which was a really good learning for me. It was a great revelation for me because I realized that this isn't um, this isn't normal. Like, there's not actually that many books you'll read with this level of of, of landscape engagement, um, which is so, was so cool. I'm like, man, and it was good for. It's actually been good for me since because I've I've been able to really think. Wow, okay, Kyle. Again, the ocean's important to you. Get out there and make sure you you, you fill that bucket. Yeah, make sure you get out there and fill yourself up with that. Um, with the bluffs, now I'm thinking about it more. I'm thinking, man, like. I do love mountain walk. Like I love the mountains. I love bushwalking. I love hiking. And that's not everyone loves that. Uh, so I just, anyway, so I'm learning myself just how important the landscape is to me, but also what I, what I love to do in my books is to be really, I just like to get into the specifics. So if I'm talking about a tree, I want to name the tree because it's not every tree is different and every tree has got its own spirit. Every tree has got its own character. And, and what I enjoyed doing more with the bluffs because there was a bit more flora in the bluffs. But I like to, you know, with, with the deep, talking about these underwater scenes because I want people to, you know, to, to be travelled there. I want people to feel like they're there. And I don't want to just talk about the seaweed. I want to, like, name the seaweed. I want to name the colours. I want to talk about the play of light and, and, and sound. I want to talk about the bubbles and the silt because because I what I want to give to my readers is the same experience that I had. And the only way I can do that is to just to be as specific as I can. Yeah, it's, it's that whole show don't tell philosophy of, of writing, you know, and, and you certainly, um, you know, absolutely do that really, really well. Um, and I, I also want to touch on um, the aspects of Indigenous culture that you've sort of, you know, woven into your stories in the bluff. Um, it was the hungry man and, and um, you know, the, the sort of um, significance of the area um, to some of the characters in the book. And um, I can't remember the name of the young girl who wanted to have the cultural centre who was working on it. It's completely out of my mind right now. Um, but uh, I, I also found it really interesting of, of those having those elements in the deep too, you know. Um, have you sort of explored any of that sort of um, cultural relationship to the land in, in Tassie from, from that Indigenous perspective at all? Have you sort of encountered any of that? Yeah, look, it's been, it's been, it can be quite difficult um, because there'd been, there's been so much cultural heritage lost Um so the Tasmanian Aboriginals, it's it's absolutely heartbreaking. I was going to say, especially in Tasmania, yeah, yeah for sure. Especially in Tasmania, and um, so so in terms of um, the the bluffs, um, I the the Black Line, you know, the Black War, everything around that area, I didn't hear, I didn't even learn about until I was working in high schools, and they did a curriculum on it. I didn't learn this in school. Never even crossed never even crossed my desk and I was never encouraged to research it either. It was just massively swept under the rug and, and wasn't until yeah this moment where I realized what? genocide happened here. Like this is so I, um, I for sure, I wanted to dive deep into that. And I, you know, I asked around and, and I spoke to um, at Tasmanian Aboriginal people, but I didn't, um, I definitely didn't do as good a job of that as I could have done. Uh, mainly because I didn't expect it to be published. Um, but also I did, the people, I did reach out to some and they didn't get back to me. And I kind of like this from my hands up, but all right, I did my job. Whereas in reality, I should have been a lot more, I should have went a lot deeper and found some more elders to kind of give me more because there's, it's just, I don't know. It's been, um, anyway. And so what, 
what I what I like to do, I'm not Tasmanian Aboriginal, as far as I know. It's hard, you know, the records of they're hard to track down. But I don't think I'm Tasmanian Aboriginal. I don't identify as Tasmanian Aboriginal. And so there's these interesting questions about whether I can write about it. Um, and there's this question. And so uh, there's interesting questions about um, putting stories out there that have a narrative around Tasmanian Aboriginal without being from someone. But the counter of that is the fact that there aren't, they don't feature in fiction very much. The culture of Tasmanian Aboriginals doesn't really feature. And so part of what, what I was taught anyway about an acknowledgement of country is the acknowledgement of country is about engaging with the stories of the area. And I was, when I, I did some cultural awareness training, um, like, like how I work, how to do it. It wasn't just me. I wasn't told go do it. It's like everyone did it, but it was really, it was really good, really good. And part of what um, the gentleman explained to us was that the acknowledgement of country works so much more meaningfully when it's about tapping into story. And for me as a storyteller, I'm like, great. When I'm talking about um, Eagle Hawk Neck, I want to talk about, I want to talk about, I want to talk about Tasmanian Aboriginals. I want to, I want to give them a lot of, a lot of space on the page. Not, not because, um, even though I can't write about it because from that perspective, because I'm not Tasmanian Aboriginal, they're definitely part of my island. They're part of where I live. They're part of. I work with a lot of Tasmanian Aboriginal um, clients. And I'm really passionate about just including Tasmanian Aboriginals in my fiction. And it's been great. Like I haven't had any, you know, no one, I've had no backlash. Um, no one's been like, oh man, you shouldn't be writing about this, which is, you know, pretty rational really considering it's fiction. But I definitely, like I get a bit, I'm, I'm more astounded that people don't include acknowledgement of country at the back of the front of their book in, in Australia. I, I'm, and I'm, I'm just, I get quite a, worked up about the fact that I didn't learn about any of this in school. Um, I'm happy now people are learning about it at school, but I just, I feel like I could have been such a more, I, I feel like there's so much more we could have done if we knew about this sooner or if I knew about this sooner or if this, we were more anyway. So anything I can do towards that, I can hear I'm quite passionate about this. So I, I want, everything in my book is something I'm passionate about. And it has to come across that way. And, and I'm really passionate about the injustices faced by the Tasmanian Aboriginals, about the fact that they don't have nearly enough um, airtime in our culture as they should. And anything I can do to include them in my story is just got to be there because they're, they're the original storytellers of this country. And again, my stories are so landscape based. Yeah, look, it doesn't, it doesn't come across as appropriation at all in, in the novels, I don't think. I think it comes more from a, a place of respect and acknowledgement, and I think that's you know, a credit to you. Um, um, I, I, I actually think maybe I might open the floor for anyone that's got any questions they might like to ask you. Um, if, you'd, if you'd like to ask Kyle a question, either put it in the chat um, or, or unmute yourself or wave at me because I can see you across the top there and you can ask a question. So please, I'm, I'm going to open the floor for a couple of questions to Kyle, if anyone's got one. Julie's unmuted herself. I think she wants to ask you something, Kyle. I'm going to mute me now. Go ahead, Julie. Thanks, sir. Kyle, um, I was doing a little bit of reading of the article um, of when you were writing the bluff, and it mentioned that you have seen some strange things in the bush <laughs> that defy explanation and are best not spoken about. Please speak about some of them, please. The thing is, Julie, and I know I know it's a tease to even have it in there, but the nature of these things that go bump in the night, the nature of things that we don't have a scientific explanation for yet, if you talk about these things, they start talking back. And if you, if you, it's like, if you look into the void, the void stares back. And if you look into these things, they start staring back. So that's, that's the reason I don't talk about them because I, I, I don't need the hassle and I'm sure no one else needs the hassle either, but how, yeah, it's things seen, things heard, things speaking to me things 
quite hostile. Yeah, it's all. It's yeah, no, nah, it's. <laughs> I, can't, I can't really go any more detail than that. You're coming across as quite a spiritually sensitive person, Kyle. I'm sure you would you would scoff at that, but it certainly sounds like you're very sensitive to your surroundings, and I suppose the fact that you were in you're in the profession of counselling and that's that's your profession sort of speaks to that. Um, yeah, it, it's it, and again, it definitely comes across in in your writing. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Kyle? Because I could ask questions all night, but that's you know, if if anyone else would like to ask something, please, please do. <laughs> yep, hang on, someone's unmuted. Go ahead. They're all Friday cats. <laughs> Uh, or are you just enjoying listening, which is fine? Um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna turn my video off real quick while I grab my phone charger. Keep talking, I can hear you. Okay, okay. Um, I I also wanted to talk about. Um, I did read something in the notes that I was sent about the fact that the the deep in particular, um, the deep morphed from a story that was originally going to be about housewives, Kyle. <laughs> I, I want to know what what was that story going to be? Could you tell us a little bit about how that what what that what you were originally thinking that story was going to look like? Yeah, for sure. So, sorry, there we go. So, how the story began when I first wanted to write this book was I was working in. Here's my cat. I was working in this in this um, drug and alcohol rehab, and. I had a client basically give me, so I'm just trying to get her comfortable. Can you make up your mind? I was, I was trying to get, um, we got to the end of this session and this client of mine basically gave me a blow by blow instruction manual for how to start my own ice syndicate. And I thought as okay. a book, yeah. <laughs> um, and what I wanted to do, like the little things at the start, like how to, where to steal the money from to get it started, how to launder that money, then how to find someone who can get you the precursor chemicals, how to find someone who can cook the chemicals, best place to market them, how to market them, how to launder that money, how to bribe the cops, how to find cops you can bribe, how, like all this stuff. And I thought this information Imagine if I weaponized the most unlikely character with this information. And I had this great idea of, of giving um, this suburban housewife and her mother's club to weaponize them with this information. Um, and, I, and I wrote that book. Honestly, that was the first draft. Uh, Shelby was the main character originally. But what, what, I soon discovered is that I'm really not that good at writing suburban housewives. I'm definitely not very good at writing about, about um, mums. Not that, I mean, I, I did okay. Like I'm not, I'm, I'm still, I'm a fairly well-rounded individual and I work in mental health. Like I do have some understanding, but I was trying to force them to do something that they just wouldn't do. And my publisher's like, no mum would do this guy. And I said, but what about this? She's like, no, nah, they wouldn't do it. And so I had to kind of stand back and look at the fact that I could write about males really well. I really, I know how the male mind works. I know um, about what makes them tick. When it comes to writing females and people who identify as female, I'm, I'm not nearly as <laughs> good at it, apparently. And so I took that feedback on the chin. I'm like, yeah, cool. Okay. I can't write suburban housewives as well as i might like to think i can funnily enough um so i just thought i'm not even gonna, i'm not even gonna um try and so then it changed i just removed that subplot um and then the rest they just kind of stepped up so forest ahab and mac just stepped up to take over that space um however for book four i still want to do this for book four i want to have like the most unlikely um person um, a really successful, um, a really successful, like, you know, in business, single mum, well put together, well to do, 
suddenly something happens and she has to like start a drug syndicate. Oh, I, I just love it. I love it in my mind. But what I'm discovering is that any books have an energy of their own that they want to do. And that if I try and force them to do something, they don't like it, uh, which is what I found with, with the deep. Yeah. Great. No, that's something that's, I'm, I'm fascinated. I would still love to see that. The Mother's Club idea. I love that idea. I love it. I want to see that book. Um, now, I, um, I've got a couple of questions from the chat, the chat box now. Um, Linda wanted to know, how are your clients with your new fame? Have any of them read your stories or have you given them your stories to read or would that be too close to home and a bit exposing? I think um, there's some of them have read them, but a lot of the a lot of the guys I work with, a lot of my friends even, they don't read. Um, and so there's a few there's a few like of my old clients who became graduates of the program who then became volunteers. I thank them in the back of the book um, in the acknowledgements. You can see me thank them by name. And <laughs> like I asked them, hey, can I say your name? They're like, yeah. Like one of them's in prison now, you know. Um, and they're 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 like they don't really to be honest i don't think they care too much um like it doesn't in that world to be a writer doesn't have that much um impact but like i was with a mate the other day went to a house again another house with affiliations and he said oh this is kyle he's my best mate he's a best-selling author no one in the no one in the room cared (laughs) like literally no one cared um, what I'm very careful to do, I get this question quite a lot, which I don't know might be in the question there about, am I allowed to write about these stories or, or that, you know, should I be writing about these stories? But what I, what I can say is I, I'm very good at de-identifying. Um, and also it's not, there's danger to me if I write about certain things about the criminal world, if I was to go and identify you know even the people i was talking about before then you know it's there's there's actual there's physical danger to me so i'm very vigilant about not identifying and i'm very vigilant about being respectful from like a whole range of reasons no fair enough um the other question is is that some storyboarding behind you kyle (laughs) is this is this another novel in the planning on behind you on the wall and and are you a detailed story planner like are you (laughs) someone who obviously has an, a number of elements that you sort of flip around and, and do the, do, I want to ask, do the colours of the notes have any significance or is it just you ran out of one and you started a new one? So the char- the colours are different characters. They're my point of view characters. So it is storyboarding. And so it goes from this way to that way. It's their character arc. This was like months ago. I don't, I haven't looked at that for ages. I don't think it's still relevant, but I just leave it up there in case. I don't like, look, actually, no, that's, I'll look at that when I've finished this first draft and I'll go back here and make sure it's in place. I don't want to like diminish this, but what I will say is that I don't plot at all. And it's been the bane of my writing existence is that I don't plot. Hence, you know, I wrote this book about a mother's club and I wrote the whole thing and it didn't work because I was just shooting from the hip. So I was trying to plot out my third book, my third book I'm writing at the moment. Um, um, And I, I had a foray into this and a four eight, I'll show you another one. Let me just give me a second. This is a, I'm giving you a unique insight here. This is another, uh, I did this one recently. And this is my current plan. And each of those threads is a different character. And so I've got them starting out. And this is where they kind of cross over with each other. And then in my mind, I know where it ends, but like, kind of the bottom represents different emotional journeys and i'm trying all these different things too because i don't plot and i keep wasting time and I'm, <laughs> hoping, I'm hoping it'll work but but in reality the way i the way i write is kind of like um i think stephen king says it or maybe with someone else talks about it being like archaeology where you're like you, you're digging slowly to reveal something you're not sure what it is yeah that's uh, stephen king yeah, and that's yeah. that's I write exactly like him. He, I think he says like if you can get away with not plotting, don't plot. Yeah. So that's what I'm <laughs> I'm trying to go back to what I'm good at. But yes, this is storyboarding, and I'm hoping I'm hoping it helped somehow. I'm hoping it dropped something into me, um, and I'm hoping that 
the kind of hybrid of plotting slash not plotting works in this next book. Mm. Can we have any hints about what the next book is going to be about, Kyle? Yes, yeah, so it's another. I know tab- everyone wants to know. <laughs> <laughs> I reserve the right to change this because, again, books change quite dramatically. But at the moment, it's about a bricklayer whose wife and daughter get kidnapped by a cult in the Tasmanian wilderness. Oh, I like it already. That sounds great. Um, right, I'm going to ask if there are any more questions from the floor, from the room. No? Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to come back to one last thing. Um, coming back to how long it took you to break through, and um, mm. you've sort of given us a little bit of advice about plotting and so forth. Um, I read a, an article, a memoir article, that you just wrote very recently for the, the Griffith Review. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. Um, I commend everyone to to get a copy of that if you can. It was fantastic. Um, really, um, really interesting way that you wrote, sort of a dialogue with yourself almost about writing and um, your profession. Um, but the last line in that was, um, "Writing is like eating waffles. It doesn't need a reason, but it costs more than you expect. What has writing cost you, and was it worth it?" One of the things that's cost me recently is I've had physical injury to my arms. I've got carpal tunnel now. Um, and that came from the fact I made, um, to get 30,000 words of edits into two weeks. Uh, and also I have really poor setup when it came to writing. I, um, I'm the kind of writer who just I lose focus pretty quickly. <laughs> I don't know if it's come apparent or not, but I like to go to cafes. I like to go to the lookout. I love to go to the ocean. I like to go up the Eagle Hawk Neck. And I'm always crouched over my laptop. So, yeah, I cooked my arms. What else it's cost me is that I have never had a full-time job. Uh, so maybe I have before I started, like maybe back in my 20s, early 20s. Because every job I've had, I've made sure to do it part-time so that I could write as well. Because my goal has always been to be a writer. And so in terms of like life goals and milestones, um, there's a lot that I've, I've, passed, I've passed by, let pass by because I've been focused on being a writer. Um, there's motions that come out of even reading even reading a good review, um, it's emotionally draining, emotionally taxing, and you remember it. And so it's quite hard sometimes to, to interact in, in society, try and think you're normal in the back of your mind thinking, man, I've got two books out there that anyone can read and anyone can comment about. Like that's, it's an extraordinarily vulnerable place to be. And I'm lucky that I'm, I'm pretty, I've got pretty good perspective with my job. Um, so I don't like, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty stable really with that stuff, but I understand why a lot of writers get, get, can get quite derailed by that kind of stuff. And, and I definitely know, you know, constant, I get constant messages from people, which is all really good, but it brings its own challenges because every single interaction is something I've got to think about. And then that drains me from to socialize with other people. Um, drains me from my writing like it's just all these success brings its own challenges but the writing of 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 a book and the 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 expression of that art and and what it actually costs you to do um is is a cost that is significant it's i was i'm listening to a, a master class by julie julie bloom at the moment um on the masterclass app if you want to be a writer i recommend the masterclass app even though it's super expensive the writing lessons are next level and judy bloom was basically saying look writing isn't fun like there's nothing when you've got a book out there it's good but like it's not i wouldn't wish this on anyone <laughs> i mean she's like talks about the benefits of creativity and she like you know she pinches herself she gets to do this and that's how i feel i'm like oh man i nominated you know book of the year five times now for the bluffs like it's i'm living the dream I, I i wish everyone could feel this but also i wouldn't wish being a writer on anyone like it's bloody hard work it takes it takes a toll 
and and you need to be ready to pay that i think if you if you want to if you want this to be you know your your reason for being on the earth anyway that was a good question no one's asked me that question yet yay <laughs> That's, that's interviewer goals for me. So thanks, <laughs> Rebecca. Um, look, I think I think we'll probably wind um, wind this session up now. Um, I uh, there's a couple of comments here in in the chat. Um, Lindsay has said, "Thanks, Kyle. It's been such an interesting talk. Lots of thought provoking points. Can't wait to read your books, but I'm not about to sign up for scuba diving or taking up a certain sort of manufacturing." Good <laughs> point, Lindsay. Don't blame you. Um, from Nina, I've loved listening. Thanks so much for giving your time. I love both books and recommend them to my friends. Looking forward to the next one, as are we all. Thanks, Nina. I, I absolutely agree. Um, look, I would just like to thank everyone for attending tonight and um, to Kyle for being so open and, and honest and um, thoughtful with your responses. Um, it's been a real privilege to meet you. I've, I've been very excited about this for so long. So I'm so glad we were finally able to make it happen. Yeah, um, sure. Thank you very much. And uh, we will definitely put this recording up um, for the rest of the wonderful Kingston community to be able to, to hear you speak about your writing. And hopefully you'll get lots more loans and, uh, and that will help you uh, earn little little bits and pieces of royalty because every time it gets borrowed you'll you'll get paid so we want to yeah. help you with that <laughs> yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. all right well look you you keep working hard on on number three for us at least <laughs> um to uh the, the the next book um can't wait to see it um hopefully the next time we meet it'll be in real life yes let's hope <laughs> let's aim for that um thanks everyone so much for coming really appreciate it um, and watch out for the recording soon. Um, on behalf of Kingston Libraries, thank you very much, Kyle Perry. I'm going to give you a clap so you can hear oh, some applause. You. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, and um, look after yourselves. Everyone, take care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kyle. Um, thanks, Sue. And, I, and thank you, Sue. Thanks for the pivot, especially with the, the dates and this online. No, really, no. Thank you very much for um, being able to accommodate it. That was uh, it was really great. So um, thank you very much. I'm going to.